All right, so welcome everybody to the Zephyr Mini Summit. And uh, the first part of the Mini Summit is a small presentation. Uh, it's an introduction to the Zephyr Artos. I don't know how many of you are familiar. Maybe you could have a raise of hands, quick raise of hands of how many of you are familiar with Zephyr to the extent that you know more or less how it works or how to use it at least, how to use it. <laughs> All right, so uh, most of you are not familiar with it, which is good because that's, uh, that's sort of what the, the, the audience that this uh, presentation targets. So let's start by talking about Zephyr. Um, let's start. So the Zephyr project is uh, an open source real-time operating system, but that almost goes without saying because I guess most of you already know that. Uh, and essentially it was designed and developed uh, a while back, a few years back, in order to fill a void. Um, the, the void that it's there to fill is one of a complete solution for embedded development for small microcontrollers. It can extend to more of that, but that was the original goal. And uh, the way that that was done by the original creators of the project and that then handed over uh, to the Linux Foundation is trying to focus on a few key areas uh, in order to make sure that the project is, is useful to people who are used to embedded development. And by embedded, I really don't mean embedded Linux. I mean the, the tiny ones, the, the small MCUs that range from you know, hundreds of K of ROM to maybe a megabyte and uh, dozens to hundreds of K of RAM. So it cannot run Linux or, you know, very, uh, you, would ha you have to stretch it and put some external memory on them and it's not really practical. And uh, so what we needed is, what the world needed <laughs> at the time, is uh, something that has an open community, because there were other open source projects at the time, well, sort of open source, like FreeRTOS now is an open source project, but by, back then when Zephyr appeared was not. So when the, an open source project that's truly open source, that has a, a, a vibrant community, many people contributing, not only vendors, silicon vendors, of which there are many, contributing to Zephyr, but also people uh, in general, users, the very users, um, you know, you know or, or everybody here knows what uh, makes open source successful. So um, uh, then there was, there's a push within Zephyr to make it safe and secure, so that's one of the, uh, uh, the goals with the project. Uh, another important factor that, you know, might sound obvious for most of you, but in fact, some operating systems for embedded uh, devices do not uh, align with is being cross architecture. So it's, it's cross architecture, cross SOC, cross board. So like you're used with Linux and uh, many other projects, this is completely neutral from a hardware pr perspective. Uh, the government is, it also, the government is, is open. It's let, uh, or it's now in the hands of the Linux Foundation. It's vendor neutral, means there's people like me from Nordic Semiconductor contributing to the project, but also people from Intel, people from uh, companies using Zephyr uh, to make their own products. So there's a little bit of everything. In the case of Nordic, we actually use Zephyr to ship our SDK. So um, when you, when you uh, download the SDK from Nordic, it's based uh, partially on Zephyr. It's also permissively licensed. This is because unlike Linux, um, you end up, it's like a little bit like a, uh, you, every time you build your application, you also build the kernel and link everything together. So GPL is less uh, of an option uh, than in the Linux world. So uh, a, a, a permissive license was chosen. And the old adage, uh, batteries included, really applies to Zephyr, so it, it comes complete. You don't need to put together, take, to take Zephyr as a kernel, like you do from, with some other uh, competing projects, and then take a TCP IP stack, a Bluetooth stack, and then put them to, together. The idea is to have a single code base of highly in integrated uh, code <coughs> that implements everything you need to write uh, a, a small microcontroller application, um, no matter what technology you use. So that's the, that's the idea. And then, the, like, coming back to the, uh, uh, to the idea of it being uh, focusing on safety and security, there's, there's the fact that uh, the project issues its own CVEs, that it uh, follows security practices and so on, but also there's a, there's a push towards certifying it to be uh, uh, in an auditable branch to, be, uh, to have a, certain, a, a series of certificates that are important for those that have to ship products that comply with safety requirements. So this is the, you know, one slide pitch of, of Zephyr. But uh, in terms of getting a little bit more technical, what does it support? So most of the architectures here have been added either because they, there's lots of hardware um, that, you know, it's used or that Zephyr is a good fit for, or just because uh, the vendors themselves from the making chips based on those architectures have contributed support to, to them. So we today we support all of those. Um, in the case of ARM, uh, it's, I'd like to mention that it started with Cortex-M only. 
uh, and then slowly uh, external companies have come vendors or you know companies making boards or chips or products even uh, with more complex cortex r and cortex a cores and they have joined uh, zephyr uh, um, and contributed support for this more powerful course and now we have fairly good support for uh, many 64-bit cortex a cores some cortex r, -R cores and almost every single cortex m core out there for the rest of, uh, of the um, of the architectures, RISC-5 is extremely popular. So you can imagine uh, the technology is popular, but it's also very popular within Zephyr. Um, and uh, it's gaining more and more traction. So this is the, the architecture that it runs on today. Archite new architectures are not added frequently. So this slide doesn't need updating frequently, which is good. Uh, and then we have the members. Those change a little bit more often. Um, Usually, they, they, we increase the, the count, uh, uh, luckily. And uh, these are the Plantinum members, so the ones that are more well, engaged with the project in this manner, although obviously this is a completely vendor-neutral project, and you can engage in any way you want. You can uh, send a patch for documentation, or send uh, a new, new board support, a new architecture, or even fix a bug in the Bluetooth stack, whatever you want. But some companies choose to uh, uh, support the project in this way, and those are the, the current Platinum members. Uh, so some pretty big names in there. Then there's the silver members. So again, many companies out there that either use or want to use Zephyr or are using Zephyr and uh, want to contribute in this way. In terms of boards, we have too many. Actually, the board system in Zephyr, um, as it stands today, it's, uh, you know, it, it, I, I don't think it has scaled uh, in the way that we need for the hardware of today. So that's one of the projects that we have at Nordic is to try and improve the model of board that we have in Zephyr today because the model of board today is like a compilation unit, meaning uh, you write, uh, you take Zephyr and you compile it for one particular set of, uh, of characteristics of hardware, you know, core, uh, peripherals, and uh, uh, SOC, uh, and so on, but that's not enough today. Today, you have multi-core devices, you have um, multiple images in a single core, so bootloader, uh, trusted ex execution environment, and so on. So it's very hard to, for the concept of board as it stands today to cover all of this. It's basically outgrown. Uh, that so that's one thing that we want to do. But th that's a, a bit of a side note. In terms of actual physical boards that we support, there's tons, uh, more than 400. Many are ARM-based, but there's lots of RISC-5 and uh, many x86 and and from other architectures as well. Um, not all are actively developed, as you can imagine, like many, in many other projects. So some some boards come and go. In general, we make an effort to keep them all uh, supported, and we only. We have been forced in the past to uh, remove one of two boards if the maintainers weren't there to, uh, uh, for example, to port to a new uh, API that was uh, absolutely indispensable to move the project forward. But in general, we, we try to keep them working and test them as much as we can. All right, then uh, a few example products uh, of running Zephyr today. That's Taunt, but in fact, you know, if you think about it, uh, being like I am from Nordic, I have to say that anything that has a Nordic chip inside one of the of our latest uh, Nordic chips runs Zephyr effectively, unless the customer has gone to the, to the trouble of replacing the whole software stack with whatever they want, which is unusual to say the least. So um, anything based on our uh, chips from the last couple of years or so, because the SDK itself is based on Zephyr, the product itself is almost certainly uh, running on uh, running Zephyr as well. One of the uh, maybe more interesting examples here on the on the bottom right, we have uh, Vestas wind turbines. Um, Henrik here from Vestas is, is with us today, and uh, that's one of the mo perhaps one of the biggest devices running Zephyr today. So yeah, architecture. So this is this is a fairly standard slide. It doesn't it really doesn't say that much about Zephyr in particular, but I have it here just so you can see the extent of the functionality that Zephyr provides. It really comes with almost everything included. So from the high level networking protocols like LWM to M, MQT, I mean, high level, <laughs> depends on, what, on how you look at it. But uh, anyway, from, from application level uh, protocols, uh, obviously the, the crypto, the networking crypt, uh, crypto functionality, the TLS and TLS, uh, um, TCP IP, of course, there's a native TCP IP stack, there's a native Bluetooth stack, there's a native 15.4 stack, there's a partially native uh, Wi-Fi interface, though not a stack yet. So that's something that um, we're looking actively into as well, uh, writing a, a, a Wi-Fi stack. But that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a major undertaking. So Wi-Fi right now, it's essentially a control plane API, and then the actual heavy lifting is done, offloaded in a separate chip. Uh, 
Um, one of the things that uh, in this slide, aside from the breadth of uh, things that are supported, I wanted to really highlight uh, for those of you that are not new to the project is the fact that all of this uh, is extremely configurable. So Zephyr uses kconfig and device tree just like the, the Linux kernel. The difference is that it's all done at build time because there's no, not enough resources in the typical uh, target uh, that Zephyr runs on to actually you know, run the, the parse the, the device tree blob at, uh, at runtime. So all, most of the logic and most of the control that uh, kconfig and device tree provide are injected uh, directly into the build system and dealt with at compile time. He has cooperative and preemptive threading, which is very useful. Uh, and, uh, many of the stacks in Zephyr run in, in cooperative mode, uh, just to simplify in general code size and reduce uh, uh, ch chances of um, issues, multi-threading issues. Uh, almost everything in Zephyr is statically allocated. Of course, there's a malloc. Of course, there's support for uh, the C library malloc. Of course, there are even specialized algorithms for uh, you know, bucket-based allocation and even uh, others. But in general, if you look at the even the TCP IP stack, um, the actual size of the buffers and the buffers themselves are typically allocated for the TCP IP stack and only for it um, at compile time so that you have full control then when you hit a problem, uh, uh, a memory allocation problem or a, or a resource starvation problem, you know that it's not some other uh, subsystem in the RTOS that's influencing you. You know that that's the the uh, TCP IP stack and where, where to target, where to profile, uh, where to find for the bottleneck or the, the, the problem that's uh, starving your, uh, uh, your protocol stack. There's a standard device driver interface. Uh, I'm pretty sure we'll talk about that during the, um, the hands-on later. There's some advanced functionality like memory protection, stack overflow protection, and these sort of things that used, uh, some of them are used routinely even in, on tiny microcontrollers. Some of the others like user space, uh, uh, which is the equivalent of threat is isolation here, uh, are used typically only in certain uh, higher, you know, higher range uh, uh, CPUs. Uh, Bluetooth is a native stack. That's on, for those of you who are not familiar with Bluetooth uh, implementations out there, it's relatively uncommon to have a native implementation of uh, the full uh, Bluetooth uh, specification. That includes both the host and the controller. Uh, integration with OpenThread. Now, Thread is gaining momentum uh, as a technology for home automation. So, uh, uh, integration with OpenThread is something that uh, I think we contributed uh, three years ago or so, and it's been very, very uh, successful in terms of uses and uh, users and, uh, and products out there. And the native networking stack. So it's all about the tight, the, the tight coupling, right, in Zephyr in general. We tried, we've tended to implement things from scratch, except obviously where it doesn't make sense, uh, in order to maintain that tight coupling. Every layer you add, you take from outside, every open thread you integrate with, uh, we have not implemented thread because it's too big, but Impl taking open thread into Zephyr duplicates some, some code, and there's a porting layer, and there's some overhead there. There's nothing you can do about that. So in general, we tend to prefer um, uh, implementations that are native to the OS, that use the primitives that are provided by the, by the OS. So this was a very, very high level overview of Zephyr and what it does. But because today it's a, uh, it's a mini summit where, we, where the focus is hands-on, I wanted to spend the rest of the of the presentation talking about the tool we're going to use. It's called West. So this tool was designed a, a, a while back. Let me just uh, uh, switch forward to the next uh, slide. Essentially, it's uh, one of those tools that uh, is a bit like if you think about kubectl or one of those tools that allow you to do multiple things in one single uh, command line interface, entry point. So uh, it's all about controlling the uh, repository management and the building and the flashing and the debugging of uh, Zephyr-based applications in a single package. Okay. So uh, there's a lot of uh, information. This, the, the, the section on West in the official Zephyr documentation is pretty big, and I recommend you at least browse through it. Um, it one thing I want to say is that West was designed for uh, ease of use and was designed to help uh, Zephyr users achieve what they need, but it's not required. One of the tenants, we, when we started developing it, when we started working on West uh, three or four years ago, we said that you will always be able to build the Zephyr, the same Zephyr applications with CMake directly, because that's the build system that we use, um, without requiring West. So West would never be entirely required. However, not using West, it's a bit of a pain in, in the rear. Uh, so you have to know what you're doing if you're going to uh, avoid using West. 
it's its own independent project. And in fact, many people, not, not I don't know if many is the right adjective or advert, but there's quite a few people using West for their own projects outside of Zephyr, just because it's a, uh, it does a few things that are useful to other projects, in particular repository management. Right? In particular repository management, it, re it's, it manages multiple Git repositories in a way that people find useful. And that's that I originally designed for, for, uh, for Zephyr, but that then people have found useful elsewhere. So in terms of the commands, you have the proper, well, they're written here as West property. Really, I think the better way of describing them is building commands. So there's uh, init, update, config, uh, and so on. So those are the basic commands, and they mostly deal, in the case of West, with multiple repository management. So they take a manifest and they download or they clone all of the repositories that are specified by that manifest. You can update them, you can, uh, and then, ancillary uh, tasks like configuring uh, the tool itself and so on. And then West supports extension commands. So because West is based on a manifest that I'll show you in a, in a, in a minute, uh, that inside the manifest you can also specify that the particular repository that's part of the West constellation of repos um, can, can extend West itself with extension commands. And in the case of Zephyr, we do that to provide basic build flash debug functionality. So those are extension commands. They're actually implemented in the Zephyr tree, not in the West tree, those, those commands, because they're specific to Zephyr. They depend on the, on the Zephyr file system, so it doesn't make sense for those commands and that logic to be contained in the, in the West repo. Okay, so basic stuff, right? Basic stuff, uh, West in it, uh, it's, the, it's the most important command when you start out. It essentially, I'm gonna sum it up um, by telling you that essentially you point it to a repo, uh, and it clones that repo, and after that cloning the repo, it essentially creates within, or in closing that repository, it creates what we call a workspace. A workspace is just essentially saying the enclosing folder inside of which you have all the repositories that are described in a West manifest. Okay, so that's it. It's just, it, it's just a, a workspace folder, a place where you contain all of that. And the important thing in a workspace folder is you have this .west uh, uh, .west folder inside with a config, a bit like Git, really. So it's like a meta repo, if you want, a meta repo with multiple, repo, multiple Git repos inside, but the .west conf contains the config for that. Uh, as an example, one of the repos that's in there, if, if you issued that west init command, is the Zephyr repo, and in that Zephyr repo, in the root of that repo, there's a west.yaml, that is the manifest. So that's a list of repositories uh, that are necessary or that are part of the Zephyr distribution. Okay, and that West init clones the repository that you see here in the URL with GitHub, um, uh, clones that repo, and then parses the manifest and gets it ready, creates the workspace, and leaves, leaves everything ready to, uh, to work after. Uh, well, with a caveat. We'll, we'll get that to a minute. So this is the manifest, what it looks like. It's just a YAML file. Uh, let's skip through the defaults, and uh, there's a place to put your remotes. If you if you have familiar, if you ever seen Google's repo tool, this is very similar. It really is very similar. There's a few fundamental differences. If, if you're curious about why we wrote West and we didn't use Google repo, we thought long and hard about using Google repo. It's not that we ignored it, and it's all described. And we, we wrote down our thoughts, and it's in the um, it's in the the West documentation pages on the official Zephyr doc. So I recommend you go there if you're curious about why we wrote yet another tool. Um, so the the, re the the actual repositories themselves are just entries in a in a YAML list, and uh, each of them you specify the revision. It can be a SHA or a branch, um, and then the last item, the self part at the bottom there, uh, that's just describing the manifest repo itself, what path it is in, and whether it extends uh, the commands West itself with commands. In this case, it does. So you have that extra line there, West commands. Okay, so that's overall in in a more graphical way. This is how it works. Main repo, Zephyr project Atos slash Zephyr, that's the GitHub uh, namespace, right? And then within it, you have this main file, west.yaml. Within that file, you have a list of projects. Remember, those are West projects. Uh, the reason I say that is because many people confuse them with Zephyr modules, and they're not equivalent. They're not equivalent. It's described again in the doc. If you have questions, please ask me after. I'm not, I don't have time to get into that, but it's important to know that the list of projects provided by the manifest, it does not map one-to-one -to, -one to what we call then later uh, Zephyr modules. But this is how it works. And then every entry points to a project. In the case of the upstream default distribution of Zephyr, all of the projects that are pointed to by the manifest are actually hosted by us. 
We don't, we don't, you can see here on the, on the boxes on the right, they're all pointing to Zephyr Project Artos. That's the GitHub organization that we maintain. And that is, uh, they're all hosted there. That's just for safety so that we don't have a repo pulled on, you know, pulled out from under us and suddenly an earlier version of Zephyr cannot be, uh, cannot be reproduced anymore, cannot be uh, cloned anymore. So once you've done the West init, you only have the, the, the main manifest repo. You actually have to run West update and that will clone all of the other repositories uh, that I described in the manifest. That's why in this image here we see now bootloader MCU boot and modules FS, FATFS as examples of the extensive list of repos that get uh, cloned when you do West update in the default distribution of Zephyr. Okay, so West init just clones uh, automatically the, uh, the, um, uh, the main manifest repository. West update then takes, reads that manifest from that manifest repos and clones everything else. Now, one thing, you can just git clone your manifest repo directly with git and then do west init dash L for local. And that will do is will create the workspace and the dot west and config and so on on an, on an already existing local git clone. So you don't need to use west init uh, to clone if you don't want to. Here's a small sentence about modules that I wanted to go back now. Um, now, modules are essentially third party code that we use that the, the Artos uses in order to provide functionality that we don't want to rewrite. A good example is embed TLS. Right? We're not going to write yet another crypto library, so it doesn't make sense. So embed TLS is a Zephyr module in this case. So we have um, we have a copy of a fork if you want. So it's a very lightweight fork in the sense that we don't keep patches downstream, but a lightweight fork of embed TLS in the Zephyr Project Artos GitHub organization, and we use that. When, when building, and we have a mechanism to integrate that source code with the Zephyr native sort of main code that is in the main Rev Zephyr repo, and uh, we, we, when you use the embed TLS in, a, in an application, that's pulled from that module. The reason we do that is for hygiene. So having we have the code that's written specifically for Zephyr is in the main Zephyr tree. Zephyr project artos uh, slice Zephyr, and everything else that comes from third parties that's developed elsewhere, essentially the policy is anything that's an external project that has its own release schedule, we put in a separate repo for, like I said, for clean separation. So we know which patches we've added to those repos. We, so we, well, we, obviously we don't want to copy all of that code and put it in the main repo. So that's the, the idea. Um, so the difference between West projects and modules is that modules are West projects that you actually build when you build your app. Whereas you can have West projects that are simply tools using doing build. For example, we have net tools that are used for network simulation. That's a West project. That's a, that's a bunch of code that you get, but it's not code that will end up in your firmware image. It's only used for, for, for testing or for performance testing and so on. So that's, that's the, the key thing. Modules are, are those projects that actually get integrated with the with West, uh, sorry, with the Zephyr build system and end up compiled into your firmware. One of the most uh, widely known uh, uses for modules in Zephyr are, are vendor HALs, sometimes loved, sometimes hated. There's a little bit of everything there. There's uh, all sorts. But vendor HALs are actually very much used by Zephyr, and there's a very good reason for that that I can, don't have time to go into now. But we use vendor HALs. We don't re-implement every single driver out there. It depends on the vendor, but in general. So those HALs essentially are shipped uh, in general, under permissive open source li uh, license, sorry, by the vendor, NXP, ST, Nordic, uh, Silicon Labs, etc. And like any other module and West projects, we clone them, we, we mirror them in the uh, in our GitHub org, and then we use them in order to uh, implement the different uh, vendor sort sort of uh, neutral or uh, vendor neutral hardware uh, APIs that Zephyr implements and offers. Okay. And then a few other workspace commands. Uh, those are just utility commands, West list to, to see all your projects, uh, manifest to display information about the, the manifest itself, and then some of those um, scripting type uh, you know, utility uh, commands like diff, status, and for all. Then those are the important ones that I want to perhaps focus more on today because those are the ones that you're going to use today. Um, so essentially the, the main extension commands that Zephyr offers as part of the of the main tree are build, pretty straightforward, that builds an application. Flash, so essentially transfer the image to a, an external, to a board, right? Typically via USB cable, but uh, uh, and typically via debugger that's built in, but there's actually Flash supports things like can open, where you can use an actual protocol 
to, uh, to send your firmware image and, uh, uh, instead of using a, a debugger. Uh, debug to start debugging, a debug server uh, to start uh, to flash the application and start the debug server locally, and then attach to attach to an already running application. Uh, I have four more minutes because I I started eight minutes late, so I'm just keeping track. See what's if I have uh, can skip something that it's more relevant than or less relevant than others. But um, no, I think we're, we're fine. Okay, so sometimes you will see this invalid choice built. Um, the reason you see that is that um, one of the, 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 the main um, sort of culprits of, of, of user confusion with West is that you have to be inside the workspace for the extension commands to work. Because the West itself only offers init, like you know, we said, right? Init, update, and uh, for all, and diff, and, but it doesn't uh, offer build. Build is offered by Zephyr itself, so you have to be inside the workspace. It gets a little bit more confusing because we're moving away, but we still support an old, no, I was going to say old, it's not that old, but a, a, an, an environment variable called Zephyr base that allows you to point, uh, to point the environment towards a Zephyr installation when West looks for commands. So if you have Zephyr base set, that environment variable set, West will find your commands everywhere because it, it, it uses that to locate them. But otherwise, if you don't use that, and, and please don't, you should not use uh, Zephyr base. Do not use that. So, especially if you're new to Zephyr, I said that in order to for you to not use it at all. Uh, then you have to CD into your workspace uh, for those commands to to work. Okay, so you just CD into into those, and then automatically Zephyr knows that. Sorry, West knows that the inside the workspace knows that the manifest is this, and knows that in the manifest there's a uh, there's some extension commands. Then a couple more things as uh, very very. Um, almost curiosity details, uh, configuration files, they're very useful actually, you can set the default board, so you can do West build and you, if 95% of the time, like it's my case, you build for the same board, you don't need an environment variable, you can use the dot config, the dot, uh, sorry, the, the user level config file, which is like uh, like almost uh, everywhere, it's, it's, it's West RC, and uh, you can, um, uh, you can then set the default board, the default uh, name of the build folder. You can set preference in terms of how builds are default to a clean build or not, and a bunch of other things. It's all described there. Very useful to if you work uh, often with West. There's also support for auto completion, uh, both for Bash and, and Z Shell. Uh, so that's useful as well um, to work more effectively with West. <laughs> And the last thing I want to say uh, is that the, the, there's, a, there's a page in the documentation dedicated to troubleshooting West. And that page is, tends to be relatively well updated uh, with new issues that people find. So I encourage you to visit that if you, if you run into trouble. Although today, of course, there's a bunch of us that uh, here that use West and have developed West and, uh, and Zephyr in general that can help you directly. But, um, uh, when we're not there, when you're back at home, then this uh, is very useful. So this covers the presentation. Uh, as I said, there's a very high level overview of Zephyr Plus, Ribbon to West. I hope you found it useful, and I hope you have fun today playing with West itself. Thank you. <laughs>